so quickly, Randy, you know, just, I mean, just after last night, you know, it's one of those things that I know I just want this thing to go on and on. I'm telling you, a great revival is taking place. Amen. A great revival is taking place. Someone, someone in this group is going to be moved. You're going to, you're going to be moved. And you're going to be moved to action. And you're going to change the world in which you live. Because you're going to affect the life of someone else after tonight. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in my life and in your life. So, without any further ado, now I may have to go do a, rate, do a sound check on you because of the speaker's things, okay? But without any further ado, I want to just reintroduce to you my brother to bring our message this evening. Randy Shoemaker. Mm -hmm. we'll, do that, we'll do that check. All check right, check it out. Yeah. Praise God. God bless. That was a powerful song. Amen. Amen. Give him another hand. That is great. 
I'm telling you what, if that song didn't move you, your move was broken. Yeah. You know, I noticed <laughs> last night. Serious. Maybe by the end of the week you'll figure out how my brain works. I don't know. <laughs> Is that but I was just thinking, no. last, last night when I, when I came in, I walked into the restroom back there and I saw it said, baby changing station. <laughs> I thought, hmm. You lay your baby on here, you close up, you pull it out, and you change, you got another one. Oh my God. That's just the way my mind. I don't know, it's just, <clears throat> I just, I can't help myself. And, and, and please forgive me, if I say something that I offend you, I do apologize. That's just the way my brain works, because I was also, again, once, once, once again, in the restroom, and, I, and you, you got, you know, I love stained glass windows. And I noticed there's one in the bathroom too. I thought, what do these people do to get the bathroom with them? <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's just things that goes across. I just can't help myself. That's just the way I am. Yeah. You know, I always tell people, they always ask my wife if I suffer from brain damage. She says, no, he actually enjoys it. You know, so that's the way it is. And I would like to introduce everybody. My wife is with me here this evening, Karen Shoemaker. She is also the chief of police down in Kaiser. So if you get caught speeding down there, can't help you. <laughs> you know? And so she, she was able to come with me tonight, and this will be the only night that, that she can come. She, doesn't, she has to listen to me all the time anyway, so you know, she don't want to come up here and listen to me uh, as well. And also, uh, quickly, I, I want to take this opportunity to uh, share with you all really, really quick that our, the revival at Sunnyside is starting uh, Sunday. Actually, we're going to start Sunday morning. We have a speaker coming in Sunday morning, and then goes Sunday night through Wednesday night. His name is David Weiss. Uh, our district had him in last year up in Westernport. He is a Christian painter, and he paints to music, and most of his paintings is anywhere from 3 to 12 minutes is all that it takes, the length of, of a song. He can have a painting done and complete. He paints on canvas, and when he's finished, it's just... There's, it's a story, and he will minister with whatever the story is. I, I really, I'd like to tell you some of it, but I don't want to go into a whole lot of it if, if you come down there. Uh, but, but real quick, one that, that he did that, that was really amazing. He was flashing pictures of some of these famous artists, Van Gogh, uh, help me with some of the... Michelangelo. Michelangelo, and some of the, the real famous ones that are found in museums. Well, he was recreating them right in front of our eyes. He was painting them real quick all the way across the stage and he had one big one in the middle and he painted to this song. And It, it was about, about a 12 minute song. About 12 minutes he had painted, I think it was like maybe four on this side and four on this side and this great big one in the middle of these famous paintings. And when he finished, he went through and he started turning them over. And the one in the middle was Jesus and all the others was the arms of Christ reached out like this on either side. And, and he does stuff like that, and he ministers through those paintings. He will tell, like Jesus told parables, he will use his painting to tell a parable. And so he's going to be at Sunnyside uh, Wednesday or Sunday through Wednesday, and I know it's a long ride for you to come, but I figure, hey, if I'm going to do it for four days, you can come do it for one. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, team up, you know, team up. No, but I really do encourage you, if you could come for one night, you will not be sorry that you made that trip. And, and you know, and it's free to come in. We have no charge at the door. You know, no, we do expect to give a pretty good offering, but um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm embarrassed so much, but I, I just, I told you, I can't help myself. But if, if I, you know, I really don't mean to, to offend anybody, but sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's just who I am. I was just way in class too, though, wasn't I? This, it was. This is who I am. This, this is who I am. I don't, I don't mean to, you know, I, I know when I first started pastoring, you know, just about every week we walk out carrying me going, who do you think that you uh, said something wrong to today? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, you know probably, probably upset somebody, but that's just who I am. And you got to love me anyway, right? Amen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't like me, pray for me anyway. You know? That's what we can do. And, you know, just listening to that song, it was just fantastic because I was thinking it was such a powerful, powerful song if we just listen to the words. And, and, and I, the neat thing, it wasn't so much it was even the words. I could see you meant what you sang. Amen. Amen. You meant what you sang. Right. 
you were feeling it as you sang it. And that means so much more to me. I would rather hear somebody, and don't take this wrong, I thought you all did a great job, but I would rather hear somebody who is not so great, but I see their heart, than somebody who has the most angelical voice of all times, but you know they don't mean a word that they sing. Amen. 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 But I believe tonight we got the best of both worlds. Amen. Yeah. That was awesome. Amen. That was awesome. Thank you very much. And I thought, man, I might not even have to, to, to do anything. But I thought it was so great because the title of tonight is The Power of Prayer. Amen. I thought, wow, what a great start. What a great start. And, and one thing I, I want to mention too, and, and, and Mike, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds. If I am, you tell me. But I really believe that you all know what this is, don't you? It's a little nip in case you don't get me bored. <laughs> no. Um, no. Okay, yeah. it's, a, it's a bottle of anointing oil. And, and I really believe God told me to bring that with me this week. That if you need anointing for anything through this week, do not wait until Wednesday. Amen. It might be too late. If you need prayer for anything, don't wait until Wednesday. Don't even wait till the end of the service. If something is said and it strikes your heart and you're like, that's me, I need prayer, you, you get on up here. You Amen. get on up here. I keep on preaching. I can come and pray for you while I'm preaching. I'll stop and preaching and pray for you, okay? That's what's supposed to be. That's what church is supposed to be about. Amen. It's not supposed to be about you just coming and listening here to some guy speak every night. It's supposed to be the power of God meeting God in this church. And I told you last night, you're going to hear a lot of repeat because this whole week's dealing with prayer. So therefore, a lot of the scriptures are going to overlap a little bit. If you have your Bibles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I used it last night. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. And see, we're just in that first line right there, he says, if my people will humble themselves and pray. And see, a lot of times we blame everybody else. We blame the world for the way things are going on. But he says, if my people, he's talking to people who are calling God their father. Amen? Amen. He's talking to you and to me. If you are a Christian and you are serving Jesus Christ, he's talking to you. If you who are called by His name, will humble yourself and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. Then He will hear from heaven and He will forgive our sin and He will heal our land. Amen. And there's a lot of power in that because people we don't understand that we're, we're always talking, this person needs to change, that person, boy, if this person would do that, if that person would do that. God wants you to change. Amen? Amen? He's speaking to you. This Bible, this word is personal. It's not for you to go and tell other people how to live their lives. It's to tell you how you live your life so that it will affect other people's lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what it's for. But too often we read it and we say, boy, I wish so-and-so had been here tonight. They sure could have used it. Anybody ever said that before? I have, but you know, let, let's be honest. I mean, you know, you, God knows it, knows it. You, you know, we can't hide it from Him. We've all said it. We've all said it. But that's not, that's not the way it should be. We need to look at it. This, this is for me. And He says, if I will turn around and I will start seeking His face. And like I said last night, that means to get in there and not stop till you get an answer. Too many times we'll have something and we'll pray for it and we'll pray, you know, for a little bit and maybe a little bit each day. But it seems like, you know, in a few days that it's gone and we stop praying for whatever it was. And then, you know, a week later we realize nothing's changed and we, who do we want to blame for? it? God. We want to blame God. God, why didn't you answer my prayer? He's probably saying, well, why didn't you seek my face? That's right. Why didn't you seek my face? We want God to bless us without doing anything in return for Him. Because, you see, we've learned so much. We've learned all of our lives as Christians. God is a God of love. Amen? Amen. God loves everybody. So, therefore, what we think that means is God will do for us whatever we want done, and we don't have to do nothing. It don't work that way. It just don't work that way. We have to seek His Face. And again, last night I used this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. Or the King James, if you have it, pray, pray without ceasing. That means you don't stop, you're always praying. And it doesn't say, pray when you feel like it. 
pray if you get the time. But rather it says, pray continually. Pray without ceasing. And I, I shared that last night too. And you know, if, if you've ever read through the whole book of Acts, you'll find out there's a lot, a lot of power in there. We read about the power of the church. We talk about that old-time religion. Anybody ever heard anybody talk about that old-time oh religion? You know, what happened to that old-time religion? What happened to the power that we had in the church? I, I read a book. Uh, some of you may have even heard of it. It's called the Azusa Street Revival. Anyone ever hear the Azusa Street Revival? I believe it was in Chicago. If I'm not, I might be wrong about that. But it's, it was the Azusa Street uh, Revival. And, and it was so powerful. The people would be calling the fire department because they said they saw flames of fire coming out from under the eaves of the roof. But there was no fire in there, but it was a fire of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's power. Amen. People were coming in. They were getting saved. It was a revival that went on. I don't know exactly how long it went on. But there would be pastors who would just come in, and they would sit there while one was preaching. And when he finished, whatever it was, sometimes they'd preach for an hour. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> an hour? But when that pastor went off, another preacher would just walk right up on the stage and they would go again. And the place was filled continually with people. Continually, day and night, preaching the gospel. People were getting saved. That's power in prayer. Amen? Amen. That's power. That's what it's about. Okay? And that all happened in the past. So let's ask this question. What's changed? Has God changed? Uh, no. No, God's not changed. How about, uh, is it because of the society we live in? Is that why it's not like that anymore? No, it's not. How about the government? You know, the government's not really any good today, so that's the reason the power in the churches has stopped, right? No, I don't think so. How about the songs that we sing? You know, we, we, we love those old hymns, and I think we should sing nothing but hymns all the time. These, these newfangled contemporary songs is coming in. Boy, that's just the devil. You know, we don't want that stuff. You know, is that what's, what's causing it? No, it's not. How about the sermons that are being preached? You know what? If our preacher preached a little better sermons, maybe, you know, we'd go away from here. We might be different people. Amen. <laughs> 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 you know this is church and we're trying to be serious <laughs> uh, but no it's not we, we want to blame the preachers we want to blame everybody else for what's going on but I'm going to tell you what it is it's a lack of prayer not only in the church but in your homes Amen. it's a lack of prayer everywhere and there is power in prayer, and we've got to get we've got to get back to it. We don't need that old time religion. That old time religion, it's old, it's past, it's gone. What we need is a new and modern day move of God. Amen. Mm. That's what we need. And there's only one way it's going to come about. It's getting down on our knees and it's seeking God the way the church in the book of Acts, when we read about that, we read that after Jesus had left, he said, I am going to send a comforter to you. I want you to go in Jerusalem and I want you to wait because I made you a promise that I will send you a comforter and you go and you wait and you pray. And it said there was over 120 people in the upper room that they were, they were praying together, daily waiting, had no idea what they was waiting on. Now, can you imagine praying for something you don't know what you're praying for? We have a hard time praying for what we do know. And here's the disciples and all these people that are praying for this comforter, and they don't even have a clue what it is. They're, they just know God, Jesus said he was going to send them a comforter. So they start praying, and they're praying and praying. Then finally, finally, on the day of Pentecost, it said that the Spirit came into that upper room. It came with a mighty rushing wind, and it landed upon each one of them as cloven tongues of fire. And it moved upon them. And then Peter went out and preached one of the greatest sermons that we read about in the Bible. And it says that that day, 3,000 people were added Amen. to the church. Amen. 3,000 people were added 
That's power. Amen. That's power. That's the kind of power that we got to get back into our churches. We need the kind of power that Paul and Silas experienced. Paul and Silas experienced when they were in the midst of the jailhouse and they prayed and they prayed until there was an earthquake and the doors bust open and the chains fell off of their hands. That's the kind of power that I want in my life. Amen. I want the kind of power that if Stephen was taking a stand for Jesus, he's being stoned, he's down on his knees and they're stoning him and he's about ready to die and he looks up and he says, I see the Son of God standing at the right or, Standing, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Amen. And then he says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. That's the kind of power that I want in my life and that we need in our church. Amen. Amen. We need that. I want the kind of power that sustained James as he had his head cut off by the sword by King Herod. I want the kind of power that he stood there and he knew that he was serving Jesus and he was willing to die for him. I want the kind of power that the church in the book of Acts experienced when they prayed for Peter. They were praying and they were praying and they were praying. Peter was in jail, but yet they continued praying. And guess what? The angel committed. He was released and set free. That's the kind of power that I want in my life. That's the kind of power we need to get back in the church. Amen. Amen. Praise yes. God. Absolutely. That's what we need back in our church. What would our church look like today if we had that power in it? This place would be full every single night. We wouldn't have to be going out trying to get people in. We wouldn't have to be saying, oh man, boy, I hope somebody comes tonight. We'd be saying, well, boy, I hope we have room to hold everybody tonight. That's what we need to be saying. I hope we have room to hold everybody tonight. And it has to take prayer. We have to get down and we have to be serious about praying for the move of God to come into our lives. And I was talking about Peter in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. It's heating up in here, Brother Mike. It says it was about this time that Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. Amen. The church was earnestly praying for him. They came together. Herod was responsible for putting him into prison. Yes, he did. But you know what? There was a driving force behind Herod too. And you know who that was? Yeah. Yeah. It was the devil. He had a driving force behind him. So we've got, you know, we've got a reason to pray because today, today, Christians are being persecuted on a daily basis. In the United States, even, we hear of, of you know, in, in the, you know, the, uh, the group ISIS and stuff going through, killing everybody and tearing down churches. And, and, and we had uh, the group from, um, oh, where were they from? The, the ladies, the group, they was up at Mike's church. Up on Africa. They were from yeah, Africa. they were somewhere in Africa. They came over. And they, they was being persecuted anyway. Time. And some of them actually saw it firsthand. They were run out of their homes. They had to hide in ditches so that they would not be killed. They were going and living with other people. And it seemed like as they ran that this group was coming after them. They, they saw it firsthand just because they were Christians. Today in our country, we've probably all heard it on the news, these things. Big business is being sued because they're taking a stand against gay marriages. Won't do certain things for gay marriages, so they're, they're being sued and being put out of business. And I read where there's a move to silence those men of God who would preach against homosexuality. You know, in our very denomination, in our very denomination just a few years ago, we had to actually bring this to our annual conference. To say we will not allow this to go on in our churches. 
If those people want to come and enter our church, praise God. I want them to come. I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Amen? Amen. I want to get them saved. I want them to get their lives straight because I don't want their blood to be on my hands. If I have the opportunity to minister to them, I will. I will minister, and that's what we have to do. <clears throat> Many churches and religious institutions are being forced to comply with legislation that endorses and funds abortion. These are things that are going on. And I want you to listen carefully to these statistics. It's estimated that 4,000 churches a year close their doors permanently. We have one that I know of in the West Marva District that just recently closed their doors. In 1920, 27 churches existed for every 10,000 Americans. In 1950, 17 churches existed for every 10,000 Americans. In 2004, 11 churches existed for every 10,000 Americans. Between 80 and 85% of all churches in America have either plateaued or are declining. Now answer this question. Do we have a reason to pray? The churches in America are declining. And it's nobody's fault but ours. We can't blame the government. We can't blame the pastors. We can't blame the music that we sing. We can't blame the school system. We can't blame law enforcement. We can't blame no one but ourselves. Those of us who call ourselves Christians, but we forgot about the power of prayer. We have a responsibility in prayer as well. <clears throat> and again, Acts chapter 12, talking about Peter in verse 5, says, so Peter was kept in prison. Listen, listen, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Their leader was gone and in prison, but they kept on praying. They kept on praying. Our prayers need to be intentional. When they were praying for Peter, they came together. They had one goal in mind. They was praying for his release. Amen? They was praying for his release. They didn't come together to discuss church policy. They didn't come together to discuss whether or not we have glass doors or a wooden door. If we leave it open, we leave it shut. We didn't come to discuss do we put fans in or not. Well, we can put them in, but we don't want to turn them on because the electric bill would be too much. You know, we don't discuss the color of the carpet or the pews. You know, are they padded or are they not? Do we use red hymnals or do we use uh, maroon hymnals? Which ones do we use? They didn't come together to discuss those things. They came together with a purpose, and their purpose was getting Peter set free out of that prison. And that's the way we have to do it. We've got to get focused, people. Amen. We've got to get focused. We have to know. how. You know, we have this thing, and I praise God for this, and you may have it too, uh, for, for our prayer. Uh, when we have prayer requests, we have what's it's called um, One Call Now. I make one phone call. You all know about that. I make one phone call, and everybody in the church gets it. Okay? Now, we can say, okay, then the whole church is praying. How do I know that? Let's be honest. Do you not think some of those people get it and never even pray for them? They say, oh, it's them again. <laughs> oh, yeah, we knew about this. But the thing is, even if we all were praying about that, we're not together. <laughs> We're all in our little homes. What would happen if we called a prayer meeting because we have a lady tomorrow going into Ruby Memorial to have a brain tumor? What if I put out a call and said, we need to meet together tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and start praying for this woman because she's going into surgery? How many people do you really think would show up? Let's get real, people. Let's get real. How many people would show up if we did so? How many would, don't answer this. How many people would show up here if that happened? Let's get real. You see, they were focused. You see, Proverbs says that where there is no vision, the people perish. If you don't have a vision for this church, 
as I look around, and, and, and again, I'm not putting you all down at all. Don't believe me. That, don't, don't think I am. I'm here to encourage you, to build you up. But if something doesn't change, these doors will be closed in about 20 years. Because you know who I don't see here tonight? Teenagers. I see one. How old are you, young lady? 17. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. We need young people in our churches today. Unfortunately, we're running them off. Because instead of praying about those young people, we're too busy putting down what they do. The clothes they wear, the color of their hair, yeah, he's usually multicolored, red, green, yellow, all this stuff. We're more concerned about that than we are, you know, and they go to Walmart and buy these ripped up jeans already before they put them on. I tell them, don't pay good money. I'll do that for free. <laughs> yeah, if you want to pay $14.95 to anybody, give it to me. I'll cut them up for you, you know. But we would rather complain about them than to get them here. Are we praying for our young people? I told my church that too. I said, if we don't get young people here, our doors are going to be closed in about 20 years. Because there ain't going to be nobody there. You need a vision. And in Habakkuk, it said the Lord replied, write down the vision and make a plane on the tablets so that they who read it can run with it. So they can run with it to read it. Have a vision. When they were praying for Peter that night, they had a vision. They were in one accord. They knew why they were there. They knew the purpose that they was there. Do you have a purpose for coming to church? In all honesty, did you have a purpose for being here tonight? I did. I come to meet with an almighty God. Amen. I come to wait and see what he's going to do before we walk out of these doors tonight. That's what I was praying for all night. Today, or today, while I was at home, I, I didn't have to work today. I, I was blessed with that and I was able to stay home. And I just, I pretty much prayed over tonight, God, what do you want me to do? And, and, and I, I knew I had the sermon ready, but it's like, God, I want you to move. I want to meet with an almighty God. I want to be like the disciples were in the upper room. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew something was going to happen because Jesus told them so. Amen? Amen. And that's why we have to come to church expecting something to happen. And I don't believe we do that anymore. I think we just come to church Get our sermon and go home. We should have been praying about this. What we do for our revival, and, and I'm not saying we're any better than anybody else, but before our revival, the Saturday before, we start a prayer vigil that goes from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, and we're praying for our revival. That's what we've been doing for years now. We started doing that. We pray for revival. We pray for lives to be changed. We pray for God to show up and move in a way that maybe we've never seen him move before. But we're expecting God to come. We're expecting great things to happen. And that's what you need to be doing. That's what you need to be doing. Pray and expecting something to happen. Pray every week for this church to be filled. You say, well, I have it. It hasn't happened yet. Then keep praying. Amen. Amen. Keep praying. See, they were all in one accord as well. We need to put all of our differences aside in the church. And if we want real power in prayer, we need to be in one accord. One mind. One accord. And that's when we're going to start seeing God move. Amen. And a lot of times, and I'm being serious, a lot of times the reason we don't pray like that is we're scared of what's going to happen. Everything might change. Well, good. Because it doesn't seem like what you're doing now is working, right? You know? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. It won't happen. Their prayers were fervent. Their prayers was without ceasing. And their prayer was urgent. They knew they had to have something done right now. So they prayed. And they prayed. And there was an urgency to their prayer. I'd love to have been in there because I bet there have been people down on their knees. There have been people laid out on their face. There have been some up and walking around with their hands up in the air just praising God and, and waiting. I bet it was just a wonderful sight to see, to be there. They were excited and they were fervent about it. James 5.16 says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail much. As I mentioned last night, Jesus is an example in the Garden of Gethsemane. Praying until the streets 
drops of blood was coming out of his pores. It was a fervent prayer. And he was wanting to hear from his father. What can I do? What can I do? And our prayers need to be intimate. Like I said, we need to come together. When was the last time you had a good old-fashioned prayer meeting? When you just come together, forget the music, forget the sermon, come together and sit down and say, let's pray this. There's one term, one of those old-fashioned terms that I really do like. It's called praying through. Anybody ever heard that term before? Pray through. You don't hear too much anymore. You know why? Because ain't no praying going on. Right. Pray through. Pray until you get an answer. Don't stop halfway. I bet a lot of us have unanswered prayers because we gave up too soon. I believe that. They were in one accord. They were together. And they were humbly bowing before God. And they were making their requests made known to, made known to God. And God moved on their behalf. It's our responsibility to pray for one another, to pray for our church, to pray for whatever's going on. People, we are in the last days. We're going to have to get it right. Sometimes it don't feel good, but it's what we need. The Bible tells me that God chastises those he loves. So if you feel that I've chastised you tonight, it's because God loves you and so do I. I believe I'm doing what God told me to do for you. You know, I, I, sometimes when I do revivals, I will get go back in all my sermons and I'll you know, kind of try to throw something together. And I didn't do that for this one. I didn't do this that for this one. This is all fresh stuff from God for you. For you. And I really believe he wanted you to hear this. Our prayers need to be intentional. They need to be intense. And they need to be intimate. It's time to learn the importance of prayer. And young lady, I encourage you to start a life of prayer at the age of 17. Because if you don't, by the time you reach the age of 27, you're going to be struggling. You're going to be struggling. God has something for you in your life. Maybe nobody else knows. Maybe you don't even know it. But I believe you're here tonight for a reason. And I want to encourage you. Start a life of prayer. Start praying for this. Are you a member of this church? Start praying for this church right now. And I know there's some other teenagers come here. I saw it on Facebook. I don't know how many. But I know there's a few that do come here. They need to start praying together. And I'll tell, I'll tell you what, you're going to like this, but none of them will. <laughs> you need to get together with all those of your age, and you start praying that more of you come in. And then, then you all can start making decisions in the church. How about that, huh? Yeah, that put a smile on her face. Yeah. But I'm telling you, that's what we need. That's what we need. It's time to stop pushing them aside and saying, you're too young. Jesus was teaching in the temple at the age of 12. Timothy was told, let no one look down upon you because of your youth. Tonight as we close, I said, if you want anointed for anything, that's what this is for. God told me to bring it with me, and I'm telling you, I'll have it tomorrow night, and I'll have it Wednesday night. I'm telling you, be expecting Wednesday night. I told you, I believe in James 1.22, be a doers of the word, not hearers only. If you're going to sit here all week and just be a hearer, I feel like I've wasted my week. You're getting a little taste of the way I treat my congregation, because I love them too. In fact, last night Fred told me going home, he said, you was easier on them than you are us. I said, I wanted them to invite me back the next night. I'm serious. If you say you believe in prayer, then get to the altar and pray. If you have something in your life or someone that you need to pray for, we can start it right here tonight. Don't wait. Wednesday night, come expecting. 
Don't expect you tomorrow night. Now, tomorrow night, just give you a little heads up, because now you're going to say, okay, preacher, you're meddling now. I'm going to talk about prayer and fasting. fasting. Don't mess with my food. <laughs> prayer and fasting tomorrow night. Prayer and fasting. So come. Come hungry. Don't fast the word of God, though. But come hungry expecting. So before we close, I just encourage you right now, even before we have a closing hymn or whatever we do, if you have something you want prayer for, someone you need prayer for, we can pray or we can anoint. We can do both, whatever you want. I encourage you to get up from your seat and come down here right now. And I will pray for you or Mike will pray for you. Is there anybody who would like to have prayer or anointing for anything? Amen. Whoa. I'm not even going to try to summarize. <laughs> wow. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Scripture does say, though, that we are to stand in the gap. Amen. It says that the Lord is looking. God was looking for someone to stand, to stand in the gap. Do you know what? When God looked down to find someone standing in the gap, he found no one. That's right. He found no one. Are you willing to stand in the gap for someone else? Are you willing to be an intercessor for that person that needs prayer, that needs to be lifted up before the Lord, <laughs> the one that's hurting the one that needs that touch from God. That you know, there's a song out. There's a contemporary song out, and and it, it's, the song says, "When you don't know what to say, just say Jesus." Just say Jesus. Well, when you don't know what to pray, Jesus. just say Jesus. Jesus. Jesus knows the inner parts of your soul and the inner parts of your heart. Mm -hmm. He knows that, and when you don't know how to pray, or what to pray. That's when it gets real. Mm -hmm. That is when it's real. That's when he knows <laughs> he's here. He cares what comes out of here. He cares what's right here. Amen, that's right. So stand in the gap. As we sing our closing hymn, as we sing our closing song tonight, this altar is still open. Randy still has the oil. And he will pray for you, and I'll pray for you. Or if there's someone that you know that you want to stand in the gap for, right here's the place to go. And he'll anoint, and we'll pray tonight. Tonight. Mm -hmm. Rick, our number. <coughs> Rick James, you're on page 600. Randy, I love your voice. I don't want you to sing. I want you to stand right here. If I know. I don't want you to sing. You stand right okay. here.
You know, I, Don Matthews, and I know you all know Don Matthews. You know Don Matthews. And I often heard him say this one saying, and maybe you'll know it, maybe someone here will know it, because uh, it's an old saying that said something about if you weren't moved tonight, you were, what's the saying I'm thinking of? Anyone know? Twice something and three, I don't know. doesn't matter, you know. If you weren't moved tonight, I don't know what to say. Yes, if you weren't moved tonight, you had to have been moved tonight. You had to have been moved. Uh, God uh, blessed the message. He ordained the message. Uh, brother, you stepped on some toes tonight. I had my step on first. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. That's how it all came in. Yeah. Yeah. Rain is also preaching to himself tonight. I know mm -hmm. that. You know, everyone's invited back tomorrow night. You know that. Uh, and I have a feeling he'll step on our toes again tomorrow. But that's going to be the Holy Spirit working. It's not Randy stepping on our toes, is it? It's God himself. That's right. It's God himself. So invite someone to come tomorrow night and have their toes stepped on too. Okay. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Our Lord God, we do come before you this evening thanking you, Lord God, for being here among us tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for instilling within my brother here the message for this church, for this time, for this hour, for this moment, Lord, for this season that we're in, that we will be moved into action as James talks about the action that we need to be in. Lord God, move us. Yes. Move us, Lord God, where you want us to be. As we leave this place this evening, Lord, we pray and ask that you go before us. Keep us safe in our travels. Yes. Put your shield of protection around our cars. Put your shield over, over mm -hmm. top of our homes and in the fronts and in the backs and on the sides, Lord. Let no evil enter our homes right. at all. Be with us tomorrow as we go about our work, as we go about our day, as we go into schools, Lord. We just pray and ask that you be with us. Speak through us. Speak through us, Lord God, what you want spoken mm -hmm. to the people that we come across. And Lord God, as we wake up tomorrow morning, getting ready for that day, let us wake up praising you and yes, thanking amen. you for the day that you've given to us and enabling us, Lord, to make the most of tomorrow. So Lord God, be with us until we can all gather back again tomorrow night. Watch over us and keep us all in your care. And it's in the name of Jesus yes. we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God.